Hey everyone, welcome back to Project Pixel, also known as Let's Make a Game with you all on YouTube. Uh, last time in episode one, uh, we did a lot actually. We um, kind of started up the set, set up the project a bit with some macros and such, and we had the, we made this little player that can move around, the camera, and some collision. Uh, it was a pretty productive episode. Um, today we're going to tweak input a little bit um, and like add controller support very easily and such. Um, and then also deal with a save system, and then also try to add like a simple splash screen. Some simple stuff today. I'm gonna start with the input tweaks. In order to do that, there's a library uh, by Juju Adams, um, which is very, very useful called input. Um, I've got it up right here, link in the description. Um, and we are just going to download it. Uh, you can go to releases on the GitHub and just download the latest version of it. And then we can go ahead and in Game Maker, hit Tools, Import Local Package, uh, and then in your downloads, just that input file right there, and then Add All and Import. Uh, input is super nice. Um, basically, it uh, does all of the like complicated like cross controller thing for you, uh, and you can just straight up define the verbs you'd like, uh, as well as have a lot easier ways of getting certain kinds of input. Um, and then just kind of like switch on the fly. So you could use the keyboard and then you could plug in a PS4 controller and it'd work. Or you can plug in a, a Xbox One controller or like a, a knockoff third party SNES controller and they would just all be supported nat natively. Um, we get this little folder called input here. I'm actually gonna create a group and we're gonna call it libraries. Uh, just so, oh, if I can spell libraries, just like that. I'm gonna drag it input into there. And then we can add more libraries in here later on, which there's gonna be a couple that I wanna add. Um, the first thing we want to do in input is we want to go uh, to this configuration, please edit these, uh, and then in profiles and default bindings. We won't touch anything else in here, don't worry. Um, and then the default bindings here, there's a keyboard and mouse and gamepad, right? So you can add more profiles as well, but there's not really that much of a need to um, because you are either using a keyboard, and mouse, or a gamepad. Um, basically, you can just define a verb um, like this. This is, by the way, a struct, if you're not aware. It's a, it's a newer data type in Game Maker that we'll talk about more later. But the important thing is, this is the name of the verb we're using, and then this is like the binding key for it, or if it's an array, um, there's multiple bindings, right? So personally, I like to keep these to one controller input, or like one input, uh, and then like we'll have a system to rebind them, you know, so the player can like personally rebind all the, all the keys. Um, but we'll just, we'll just have this be um, the arrow keys. Uh, and then for these ones, we can, by the way, delete whatever we want here. Um, for these ones, I like to use um, Z, X, C, and V. Um, X is highlighted, by the way, because it's like X and Y variable, but in a struct, you can use X, it's fine. Um, and the reason I just call them this is because they're the buttons on the keyboard that I assign these to. In fact, I can do O, R, D, Z, um, by the way, for letters and numbers, you have to put them in quotes as a string in this ORD function, and it works the same way. So ORD X, you could do ORD 9, or ORD, uh, I don't know. I think a lot of them, I think it's just letters and numbers that don't have VKs. So ORD C, whatever you'd like. Um, and then I'm going to just make that on the same liner. Um, and I, yeah, I just use the XCV because they're, you know, easy to, like, easy to reach when you're using the arrow keys. It's a nice default. And then mentally, I always think, okay, Z is like the leftmost button. It's the confirm. X is the back. C is like the speed up text and stuff, you know, and like a menu and V is some other key, you know, and I might delete one of these if we don't end up needing the key. Um, but, you know, this is the nice default I have. I don't need shoot. No reason for that. And pause escape is a good, uh, a good a good um, starting one for that and then for here we can get rid of aim and shoot here on the gamepad no need to uh, and then we're up down left and right we can use um, I just want the control stick for now and again these can they, these should be able to be rebinded eventually um, but for now we're just gonna make it the control stick um, and yeah in, in order to read these by the way um, this is just axis left vertical and then this is negative so up it's going negative it's going in the up direction right the vertical axis going up the vertical axis going down uh, the horizontal axis going left and the horizontal axis going right you know it's just yeah and then if you change this l to an r then it's the right stick on your controller instead 
And then we'll change this to Z, X, C, and V as well, just for consistency sake. And then if we hold control and middle click on one of these values here, uh, we open up the game, the game maker manual, which tells us what some of these mean. So for example, face one is A or cross, B, or, and then face two is B or circle, face three is X or square, and face four is Y or triangle. So in this case, Z is going to be our A button on a, on a, on a uh, Nintendo or a Xbox controller, uh, and, and the cross on a PlayStation controller. X is our circle on a PlayStation controller, B on an Xbox or a Nintendo controller, and C is our is um, X <laughs> on an Xbox or a uh, or a Nintendo controller, and uh, square on a PlayStation controller, and B is triangle on a PlayStation controller, or Y on a Nintendo or Xbox controller. Uh, so yeah, and you can set these to be whatever you want. Uh, in fact, that middle click uh, manual here um, tells you all of the uh, the gamepad content. So there's the D-pad. Um, the left stick is a button, right stick is a button, the start button, which is the options button on a PS4 controller, um, the select button, uh, the shoulder button, the shoulder triggers, all of that stuff is available for you, the axis. It's a bunch of other stuff, which looks like it's based on like the gyro support and stuff. I don't really know how this works, but you're welcome to experiment with that if you'd like. Uh, but yeah, so that's a nice little system here. We got up, down, left, right, ZX, CV, and pause. And those are all the verbs we're going to need right now. So we can go ahead and close that out. Make sure we save and close that out. And then we don't need to touch input or the libraries at all right now. So that's it. Let's go ahead and go to player and let's go ahead and um, and change this to work with input instead of um, the keyboard check values. So this is actually very, very easy to, um, to change. All we have to do is we have to um, replace keyboard check VK right with input check and then write as a string, which is the name of our verb. And that's it. So we can just, you know, copy paste all that, change this to left, change this to up, and change this to down. And now, as you'll see, if we run the game, it just works. It just works. And then, if you hold on one second, if you notice, and I just plugged in the PS4 controller, by the way, and it says, and it seems to have recognized it. If I move with the arrow keys, it says set the player profile to keyboard and mouse, and then all I have to do is touch the controller, and there we go, set it to gamepad. So now I'm controlling my little player with the, with the uh, PS4 controller. And then I can just switch back to the keyboard, and you can see in the little console in the bottom left, keyboard, mouse, gamepad, keyboard, mouse, etc. It just switches between, and any controller you plug in just is net natively supported. So it's fantastic. And then also, if we look at the documentation here for uh, input, um, we can look at some of the... Uh, some of the checking verbs. Input check is the same thing as keyboard check, basically. It's just like, is a button down? Uh, input check pressed is the same thing as keyboard check pressed. It's just like, um, only do it the first step it's pressed, released, only only do it once it's released, etc. Value gives you kind of like a sliding scale, so between zero and one, including decimals, which is useful for like the control stick if you want to like be able to go slowly with it or whatever. Um, blah, 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 other stuff. Um, but there's, there's some really cool ones like input consume, which if, um, if you run input consume, then you can't trigger an input check unless you release it and then press it again. Oh boy, my cord's a little finicky, my, my apologies. So for example, if I got like input check up and then I'm going up, but then I want the player to stop, even if you're going up, like you're starting a cutscene or whatever, you can consume that input and then I have to let go and do it again in order for that to work. I don't know if that's a good example, but you know, input check repeat with the delay and put check like if you double press it or if you press it for a long amount of time or like you know there's a whole bunch of really cool things and there's like the rebinding stuff and chords and combos chords are pressing multiple things at once and combos are a sequence of things there's a whole bunch of fancy things you can do with this that we might cover eventually uh if we want them in the game um but yeah it's super nice and it just natively supports like pretty much every controller there is and there's one thing i wanted to add with input real quick uh, because if you notice, uh, we actually didn't change here. I'll go to the workspace, get the create event out and I'll throw it into this little menu. We actually never touched the fit facing variable last time. Uh, and that was intentional. That's because that, you know, it's a little tricky to try to update facing with like based on the last button you pressed and such. Um, but there's a really, really handy way to do it here. We can say facing equals input, um, la check press most recent, that's what it is. And then we can, in an array, write up, 
left, down, and right. So of the directions, whatever the most recent one was pressed, uh, we're going to set facing to. Uh, running, it's not going to do much good because we don't know what facing is. I'll go to the bottom of step here, and I'll say show debug message. Remember, this just prints to the console and facing. So it'll tell us what direction we're facing every step. So it'll be down at default or undefined at default. Why is it undefined? Oh, it's undefined. That's right. That's right. My apologies. I remember instead of just this, you actually have to add at the end question mark, question mark facing. Now, this is what's called a nullish operator. It sounds a lot more complicated than it is. It just means, is this undefined? Yes. OK, just use this value instead. Is this not undefined? Cool. Use that. Super simple, right? So if we haven't pressed something most recently, then don't worry about it. Keep the old value. But if we did press something, go ahead and use it. So now it should say down instead of undefined. And there we go. And then I can, uh, and then I can move. Uh, oh, my controller's not working because my cord is bad. Um, but yeah, and then I can go right. Now it's right. Go left. Now it's left. Go up. Now it's up. Down, etc. Right. So now, if I'm moving right and then I press up, now it's up. If I'm moving down and I press left, now it's left. It's just the most recent button, which is what we want to do for something like facing. Um, and yeah, we'll go ahead and get rid of this show debug message. Uh, and then we also. And then also down here, I want to go ahead and add in a um, var recent equals. This is just temporarily for me to show you um, more of input real quick. Equals uh, input check press most recent. And then we're going to just do nothing, right? The default, if you look on the bottom left corner, is all. Um, and so you can type in all here. But I'm just going to leave it blank because that's, that's the same thing. And um, this is telling us what is the most recent verb that's been pressed. I'm going to say if. Recent, oh, if not is undefined recent, then show debug message recent. So this is just a, a, a simple like what input's being, pre being pressed. Uh, it'll tell us in the console when we're pressing a button. So like I can press left, right, up, down. I can press Z, X, C, V, and pause, right? And all of those work. And it tells me when I'm pressing them. Uh, that shows that input is working properly and all of our verbs are properly defined. I can plug in my gamepad and you see like, look, the game was open when I plugged in the gamepad and it just works. It's so nice. There's the directions. I can press X and make Z, or sorry, cross, circle and it makes X, um, square and it makes C, and triangle and it makes V. I can also press the options button and there's pause, right? So there you are. It just works. That is the entire input system that I wanted to cover in this video. Um, so I will go ahead and leave this in for now. We'll comment actually here. I'm going to say if it's not undefined and is dev build, right? So if it's not the dev build, it won't do this. All right. And that is all we want for that. But there are a couple other things I want to cover this video, um, a bunch of like kind of smaller things uh, before we jump into the big meteor things that are going to take in a, a full video to themselves. Uh, so the next thing I want to cover real quick is uh, a rudimentary splash screen. So if you go ahead and download the resources for this video, you will find a little bit of like a splash PNG. You can just go ahead in sprites and create a sprite, and we're going to call it um, SPR Splash. And then we're just going to throw that in. It's not very good. It's just kind of my like pixelated profile picture and that game by Araya. Uh, and yeah. And it's 320 by 240, which is the size of our window. And we're going to go ahead and create what's called a sequence. Mm, new sequence right here. We're going to call it SEQ, because it's you know, the beginning of sequence, uh, underscore splash, right? Uh, and then a couple things we have to do here. We first of all have to, you know, let's change the grid to 16 by 16. Don't know if we really need to, but I'm used to it. Uh, and then I believe, yeah, right here. We click on this bit, and we change this to 320 by 240. Uh, we'll zoom in a bit. And then on track panel over here, we'll hit this button and we'll load up that SPR splash right there. And it should automatically, no, we got to put it at zero, zero. All right, we got to line this up real quick. I might need some more precise grid here. There we go. That should work. And yeah, now it seems to be in this proper location. And now I have to figure out exactly um, how long we want the splash screen to be. So I believe this is in frames. 
and this is 60 FPS. So right now it's 60 frames wrong, so long, bleh, long, so it'll run for one second. Um, but let's say we want it to fade in for a second. Um, wait, I'll fade in, yeah, for a second. Wait two seconds and then fade out for a second. Uh, and then we'll test it and see if it's, it's a good time. So that means it's four seconds total, which is 240 frames. We'll go ahead and stretch our thing for the entire uh, duration. And I'm going to zoom in over here and make sure that it's all the way at the end. Yep, looks like it. Uh, now we want to go to the very beginning. And over here, where it says SPR splash, click on this and we want to hit this, uh, this little tiny plus right here. And we want to type in color multiply or click color multiply. The color we're gonna leave as, uh, as white for the most part, but the beginning is the alpha. We're gonna set that to zero, zero, and now it's transparent, right? And then we're gonna go 60 frames in, and we're going to hit, here, I'm gonna zoom in. We're gonna right click, hit add key in place, and then we're gonna change this to FF, there we go. So now what should happen is the, the first little bit uh, should be zero zero, or sorry, should, sorry, should be um, fully transparent, and then as you get closer to this, it should fade in. Perfect. If I play it, oh, if I play it from the beginning, there we go, it fades in. And then at the end here, uh, if it goes to 240, then we gotta then at 180, we want to add a new key, and that's great. And then at the very end, we add another key, and we set this one to zero zero. Sorry. Yeah, perfect. Oh, this one. I highlighted the wrong one, my bad. We want to make sure that this one is zero, zero. This one is FF. This one's also FF, and this one at the end is zero, zero, right? So it's zero, zero. It goes towards FF. It stays FF, and then it fades back out, right? Perfect. That's exactly what we want, right? Nice little splash screen. We can just time it, right? And then what we want to do is at the very end here, we want to make sure that our cursor's at the very end. Um, and then we want to hit this little lightning bolt, add moment. Uh, and we're just going to hit um, add function. And we're going to rename this to seq splash underscore events. And then we're going to move that into our sequences folder. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and get rid of this comment. And we're just going to rename this uh, splash uh, end. And then in the sequence splash itself, we're going to click on that moment. And we're going to rename that to end, just like that. Okay. So basically what this means is once it, once it uh, gets to this point, it'll call that function. So in here, I don't like this curly brace on the new line. I want to fix that, there we go. We're just gonna call um, room go to next. Very simple, right? When it ends, go to the next room. We'll go ahead and create a new room real quick. And we're gonna call it rm underscore splash. Very simple. Uh, background's great, we want it to be black. And then we want to add an asset layer uh, just call it assets. Uh, and then we want to take that sequence and we just want to drag it in. There we go. Get our grid to be the size we want it so that it'll fit right in. Uh, and then if we hit play, oh, sorry. <laughs> We're not gonna get to the splash room. Uh, let's go ahead and this little icon next to arm splash, hit it, and we're gonna move splash to the top, right? So arm splash is the first room that'll, that'll run. There we go. We didn't resize the screen properly because I forgot to do that, um, but it did indeed have a little splash screen. So we can do that by just going to viewports and cameras, enable viewports, viewport zero, visible, just like we did last time. Uh, that can be 320 by 240, and then this has to be 960 by 720. And we should be fine. Okay, by Raya. Perfect. All right, uh, and now I want to do a couple uh, housekeeping things. I'm going to go here, uh, and uh, we're going to leave camera in this room, but game we're going to delete, and we're going to move game into uh, RM Splash. We want at the at the at the beginning of the actual game we want to load things, and you know game's going to handle our load system and stuff. There we go, and game is persistent, so it'll still be there in room one because it's going to come with us when we move. There we go. We got our game by Raya. And there we go. All right, so one more thing I want to add to the splash screen, actually. Uh, we're going to go over to objects. We're going to create a new object. 
I'm gonna call this rmh underscore splash. So this is an interesting naming convention I have um, uh, for, in for objects that are room specific that handle things. So this is a room handler, right? Uh, rmh is a unique prefix, so I can go ahead and use that. It's not gonna counteract anything, any other types of assets, right? Basically, rm splash, rmh splash is gonna go in here and it's not persistent, it just stays in splash and it handles things. And the reason I want this is because I want to be able to skip the splash screen, right? So I'm gonna hit create, and in create, I'm just gonna have an alpha equals zero, all right? And then I want to have a skipping equals false. And then in our step event, which I'll make right here, full screen it, uh, I want to say uh, if not skipping, and I'll say if skipping and then else, that's what I'll do, right? So if we're not skipping, then we want to check to see, I'll just put it right here, else if. Um, if we're not skipping and, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say not is undefined. Input check press most recent, just like that, right? So my logic here, right, is, I think I need another parenthesis, yeah. Uh, my logic here is, this only return, this is undefined unless a button is currently being pressed, right? So if no button's pressed, this is gonna stay undefined, this is not gonna trigger. But as soon as a button's pressed, this is no longer undefined. So we're gonna set skipping equal to true. All right? And then if skipping is true, we're just gonna say alpha plus equals 0 0.1, for example. And then at the bottom here, we're gonna say if alpha is equal to one, or I'm gonna say if alpha is greater than or equal to one, um, then room go to next, just like that, right? And what alpha is gonna be for is I'm gonna actually add a new type of an event. I'm gonna go to workspace, uh, right here, rmh splash, I'm gonna add an event called the draw event. And this event basically lets us draw things to the screen, right? So we're gonna say draw set color, um, and then zero, 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 zero. That's a hex code for black. Uh, and then we're gonna say draw uh, set alpha. Again, alpha, uh, we're gonna call it, we're gonna just use the alpha variable, right? So when this is zero, we're drawing something transparent. When it's one, we're drawing something opaque. And then we're gonna draw a rectangle from zero, zero to game width, game height, and then false. Cause it's not an outline, we wanna fill it in. And then because drawing things, draw, like setting the alpha for drawing uh, will mess other things up. We want to set that back to one afterwards um, so we don't mess other things up. Yeah, and actually move this draw into this tab. And then once alpha is one and there's a black screen above it, there we go. So let's go ahead and run. And if we don't touch any keys, then it should just fade in like normal, fade out like normal, and there we go. But now if we, I hit the debug button, but it doesn't really matter. But now if we press a key, oh, looks like it didn't quite work. All right, let's see what happened. Um, it skipped instantly. We wanna say alpha starts at zero. If skipping alpha plus equals 0 0.1. If alpha is greater than or equal to one, skipping equals true. Um, let's see. I wonder why that just skipped. I'm gonna comment this line out and make sure that, I mean, I mean I, that line has to be the, the reason, but. Okay, yeah, that line was the reason, but the black screen never drew. Why did the black screen never draw? Ah, yep, I know why. So the reason is because if we go back to the room, uh, our instances layer is below our assets layer, which, is mean, which means the black screen is being drawn below our sequence. So we go ahead and drag that up to the top. And now it should work, but I think I have suspect it's gonna fade too quickly. Yeah. Let's go back to our RMH splash, uh, and we're gonna first of all uncomment this, and second of all we're gonna make this um, 0 0.05, make it take half as long, or sorry, double, twice as long. Perfect. I'm actually gonna say uh, 1.2, so there's a black screen for a second. 
There we go, look at that. So now, you know, we can sit here and sit through the, uh, the scene, or if we want to, we can just press a button and move on to the game. And we can do that as early as the game opening up if we would like to. Nice, perfect. Now, the next thing I want to address real quick, which actually wasn't in the plan, but I'm noticing it now and I want to do it real quick, um, is if you notice, once the game starts up, uh, the camera actually comes in from the top left to where it needs to be. I want to start the camera in the correct position so it doesn't do that. And if you like the look of the way it is, then you can totally do that. But how I'm going to do it is in camera and create, right? Because an important thing to note is these variable definitions happen before the create event, right? So in here, following should already be player. So we're actually going to say, before this, we're going to say if following is equal to no one, or sorry, if following is not equal to no one is how we're going to do this. Then we're going to say x equals following dot x minus, here's basically going to take um, these two lines right here, right? We're going to say that, but change this to x and y. So we're just going to say, oh, we're going to start at our destination if we're following something. Otherwise, it's going to be where the camera is. So that should, that should fix our problem right there, just that little bit. Yep, our camera started off in the right place. Perfect. That's two things done. That's actually three things done, my bad. Uh, the last thing I want to do today is implement a rudimentary save system, which is, I think is going to be the most fun thing today and the, the most substantial um, thing today. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into our little game object right here, and we're going we're gonna to add some things to our create event. So let's add a settings struct. And here I'm going to explain structs a little better. In order to make a struct, you just have to equals, an open brace, and then a closed brace here. Or you can call them curly brackets, braces, either one. I kind of switch between them. Um, semicolon's not required. I use it because it's a data type. And how structs work is you can say, like, variable 1, e uh, colon, 9, and then a comma. Variable 2, colon, string, and then... Um, hello world colon function uh, and then um, in here show debug message hello world or something right um, and then you could, these are all members of the struct right all variables within the struct and in order to access them you can just say settings dot hello world for example and there we've called that function or we can say um, variable uh, uh, settings dot variable one uh, plus two, we can say var 11 equals, right? You can just access them by saying the struct name dot and then the member variable. And you can nest structs as well. You can say like struct uh, colon um, and then a brace like that. And then in here be like hello colon hi or something, right? So you can nest them, and then you can say show debug message uh, settings dot struct dot hello, and that's valid, right? So structs are a very useful data type, and we use them when we talked about input and in that little profile area. That was a struct, um, but it's going to be super useful, right? Because we can save all of our settings in this struct. Uh, so some settings we want, let's say. We want a language setting eventually. I probably won't use this very much, but E and US. Uh, we, might, we might talk about changing languages. We might delete this later. I want a volume BGM, 100. A volume, oops, SFX, 100. A volume uh, BGS, 100. These are just going to be numbers for now um, that we can save and look at. Um, but we will use them when we get to our audio system. Scale, 3 by default, full screen, false by default. Right, And I, I'm using 3 arbitrarily, but that's because I've been multiplying everything by 3 in our viewport right here. So, you know, that's, that's a nice little bit of settings to start with. And these can then, the, the idea is this is the default, and we can modify them and, uh, and save them to a file. So next time we open the game, we, we keep our settings. Uh, there's a couple other things that I like to do. First of all, there's a data struct. And this is just for miscellaneous game data that's important. Like if we want to save our inventory or we want to save some of the I'm going to leave this blank for now. Um, but this is going to be basically be like complex things that we want to save uh, that we define ourselves instead of have like, you know, events or character dialogue or things like that define them. Um, but for simpler things, specifically Booleans, uh, true or false values, numbers and strings, we're going to have a more robust system to save so that we can like, 
um, we can use them individually in conversations and uh, in little bits in the game without having to worry too much about going back here and adding them to data. So I'm going to call our Boolean values flags. So we're going to have flag equals this struct here. Uh, and within this struct, we have another struct called flags, um, which we won't access outside of this. Uh, and uh, we'll have like game has started false in there, right? So has the game started yet? No, it hasn't as a default value, right? Uh, we're going to have set, and this could be a function, which takes a flag and a Boolean. And this flag is a, is a string that like refers to a flag, right? So we're setting, um, so this could be used like flag.set. It's actually going to be it's from somewhere else. Game.flag.set, and then hello, and then I want to set it to true, right? And then it'll set the flag hello to true, and later we can get the flag hello, and it'll say, oh, it's true, uh, which is very nice. And what this is going to do is it's going to it's going to say flags, uh, which you can this is in this uh, it's within flag, so flags you can you can find flags like that pretty easily, uh, and then it's going to treat it like an array, like you know you can say flags like flag to get that index, but a struct you use a a a, a little dollar sign here, right? And you would be able to say like flags dot hello, but since it's since the name of our member variable is in a variable, we can't do flags dot flag. Um, so we have to put it in like this and index it with a dollar sign. Uh, and that's the same thing as saying flags dot and then whatever's in that variable. Uh, and we're going to set that to bool very easily. And then we're going to have a get function, which just takes the flag, of course. It's going to be a little more complicated than return like flags dot uh, flags flag, because what if the flag doesn't exist within flags? Then we got an error. So what we actually want to do is we want to check if variable struct exists. Uh, useful function, we can pull in the flag struct and flag, and this checks us. Hey, and this tells us, hey, does the flag exist as a variable? If yes, then we can go ahead and return flags flag, and if no, then our default value is false, right? Oh, we're looking for a flag that wasn't set ever. Okay, it's false. And then toggle is our last function for this, right? And this is gonna just toggle a flag. Um, it's very easy. Just set flag to not get flag, right? It makes perfect sense. Is flag false? Then it's going to be true. If flag's true, it's going to be false. And because of our little uh, failsafe here, even if flag was never set before, we can still toggle it, and it'll become true. Uh, and that is the end of our little flag struct. So we're going to do the same thing with two more nums, and then strings, and I call it just STRs. Yeah, that's, sorry, num, and then STR. That's what I called them. And num is going to have another one called nums inside of it, of course, which is actually going to store the nums. And like, you know, for a default value, we're going to say r colon i random 99 plus 1. Uh, this is just basically a value between 1 and 100. That's a random value. Oh, cool. So, you know, we can use some some consistent RNG or like, you know, an shell fun value type system where at a certain random value, there can be something cool in the game, you know. Um, or we don't need to use the value or whatever. It's just there's a number that we can put into the game. Uh, it's giving us an error because this is not a colon, it's a semicolon. There we go. Uh, and then we're going to have a set function, just the same, num value. And this is identical, just nums, dollar sign num um, equals value. A get function num. We're going to say if variable struct exists, num, oh, nums num, then return nums num, same, same thing as before. as before, but our default value is going to be zero, right? Not false. Num hasn't been uh, set before. Okay, it's zero. We're going to have an add function, num and add end, set num to get num plus add end, just like that. And then we're going to have a multiply function num and factor, and we're going to say just the same as before, set num to be get num times factor, right? We don't need a, a, uh, a subtract or divide because we can just add by a negative number or multiply by one over a number. And lastly, with this little string bit, we're going to have another one called strings, and I don't know, we'll do, we'll do game title for now. We'll prob we will delete this eventually, this is a colon. Um, but just to have a string here that's saved. Um, and then we want to get uh, a set function, sorry. F 
function str and string and it's just going to say strings at str equals string again just like before this should be exact it should be identical uh, and then get function str just like before if variable struct exists strs str then return strs dollar sign str um, otherwise return an empty string right string hasn't been set it's empty and then lastly concatenate function str and then string uh, concatenate again that is what happens when you say like string one plus string two which turns out to be string one string two right it just it just adds them together like that so that's what concatenate does so concatenate will set our string to be getting the string plus string string like that and we put this in a function here in case you pass in like two then it becomes you know quote two quote so it'll add properly and there we go so there we go uh, str num flag data and settings are all of our uh, little uh things that we're going to want to save uh, in just a minute. But first of all, I'm going to create another function. I'm going to call it reset save data. And how I'm going to do this is I'm actually going to uh, move some of these things. So data, I'm actually going to make data equal nothing, right? Which it already does. But then in here, I'm going to say delete data data equals, and then here we'll put all of our defaults, right? Uh, and the thing about structs is once you're done with them, you have to delete them. But when you delete a struct, it deletes all structs inside. So for example, uh, I can delete str and it'll also delete strs. Um, then I want to, uh, here, I'll just delete them all at once at the beginning. Delete um, flag.flags, delete num.nums, and delete str.strs. Now the reason I'm doing, I'm just deleting these is because the functions can stay, right? And we don't need to save the functions because they don't change. We just need to save the flags, nums, and strings uh, sub bits, right? Uh, we can do that. We can say flag.flags equals, we can say num.nums equals, and we can say str.strs equals, just like that, right? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get our things here. So we can take that, make that empty, and paste that in there. You can take this number, make that empty, and put it right here. And then we can take um, this flag, make that empty, and put that right here. Oops. Perfect. And those are just our default values, right? When we reset the save data. Uh, and then we're going to have a function reset settings. And this is going to delete our settings and do the same thing here. We want to scroll all the way up, copy this basically, and then just like make that empty. Right? And I'm making it empty just because uh, I don't want to have to du duplicate code. If we put this in both places, uh, then we would have to change both if we wanted to change anything. But basically, I just want to put them in functions down here so that before we actually, here, we'll do like save and load functions here. And then at the very bottom, before we load our data, I want to reset settings and reset save data, right? Which will just like set the default so that if we fail to load, I'm gonna actually move settings to be above. It doesn't really matter, but uh, that's nicer for me. Settings and save data. Um, so, you know, it gives, gives us our defaults before we load so that if we load and it fails to load, uh, we, we have our defaults. All right, and now up here in save and load functions, we're gonna create a function settings save, a function settings load, a function save, and a function load. All right. And then at the bottom here, actually I'm gonna say reset settings, settings load, uh, and then settings save, then reset save data, load, then save. So the reason that we're doing it like this is because, you know, set our defaults, load a file, 
uh, and then save the file back, right? To make sure nothing got corrupted. And also, if we fail to load, if there is no file, then we can create that file right here. And same thing with our save data. All right. So before we move on with these functions, there's uh, one. There's a couple of things I have to tend to. We want to go back to our macros uh, in scripts macros. We're gonna add a macro for settings format, and a macro for save format. We'll set them zero to now. But basically, what this means is um, whenever like we update our settings or update our save in the game, we can increase this number and then force our game to convert that old save. Recognize that it's got an old save, and it'd be like, hey, we need to update this. We're going to have another macro up here. I'm going to call it settings file. And it's just going to be settings.dat. Be whatever you want. I don't know. It's a data file that's, you know, your, your settings file. Down here, we're going to say macro save file. And it's going to be game.save. I don't know. Whatever you want. It's arbitrary. Now we want to right click on our scripts folder and create a new script. And I'm going to call it scrio, right, for just input output. And here I'm going to create a couple functions that are going to help us. We're going to have a function string save to file. So we're just going to take a file name, a string, and a base64 equals false variable here, a boolean that is false by default. And I'll explain it in just a minute. We're going to have the same thing up down here, function string load from file, file name, and then uh, no string, uh, but base64 equals false as well. All right. And basically, file name is obviously the file we're going to save to or load from. String is what string we're saving. And base64 is going to be whether or not we want to encrypt our file into base64. Uh, so I do that for save files because, you know, it's all just an extra step, step to modifying your save file. Um, there are more secure encryption methods, but I don't really care. Uh, that's more useful for when you're using things like um, global leaderboards or multiplayer or things that you really don't want hacked. But for a solo single player game like this, it doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to encode it by base64. Settings file is not encoded. Save file is. That's how I do it. So first of all, we're going to say if we are encoding in base64, then our string equals base64 encode our string, right? So just like go ahead and encode it real quick. And now we're going to use something called a buffer. We're going to create var buffer equals buffer create. And it's going to be. Uh, so the first thing we need is the size of the buffer. So it's going to be the string byte length of our string, and then plus one. And then we want it to be a buffer fixed is the type, and then our alignment's one. That's a bit complicated. I'm not really going to explain it. If you're interested, you can hit, uh, you can control middle click on buffer create and read the, the manual about exactly what all this stuff means. But I don't really care. I just know this works, so that's what I'm going to be using. Uh, and then buffer write, buffer, uh, we are writing a string, and then we're writing that st and the string we have. And then we're going to say buffer save, which saves what we have in that buffer to a file. So buffer and then file name, and then buffer delete to free up that buffer afterwards so we don't have a memory leak. And that's the entire save uh, function. So then we're going to do something similar, but first we're going to check to see if our file exists. So if the file doesn't exist, then we're going to go ahead and uh, return undefined. Afterwards, we're going to say var underscore buffer equals buffer load. So we're loading this buffer from a file name, from a file name. We're going to get our string from the buffer, buffer uh, string equals buffer read buffer, and it's going to be a string. It's the type of buffer we're reading. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and delete our buffer, because we have our string. Oops. And then down here, we're going to check to see for base64 again. And if so, we can say string equals base64 decode string, and we can return our string. Perfect. And that's our load function. And before I return undefined, I'm actually going to say uh, show debug message tried to load from a non-existent file, and then parenthesis plus file name, plus parenthesis, just like that, right? So it's telling us, hey, we tried to load from a file that doesn't exist. Um, put like a warning or something in front of it. So yeah, that's our entire script. We can go ahead and close that and, and uh, close our macros as well and head back to these, these uh, functions. And now we're going to be able to use that. So this is going to be a little bit complicated, so bear with me. Um, but I think it works well. 
So saving is very easy. We're just going to create a string. And it's going to be you know equal casting to string of our settings format, um, which is 0 currently. And we're going to add a percent sign, because percent sign is never used uh, in a JSON format. And the reason we're uh, talking about JSON format is because uh, we can actually very easily convert uh, structs to JSON format. Um, you can't convert structs that contain structs, though, unfortunately, but that's not a huge deal for us. Um, so JSON string of I settings, and that will just take our setting struct and it'll turn it into a little JSON format, and it'll add our settings format and a percent sign at the beginning, and there's our string we can save. So then it's very easy. We can just say string save to file, our settings file, and our string. And it's in base64 is false by default, so we don't need to worry about it. Perfect. That's the entire setting save. So now for settings load, a little more complicated. We're going to create a var string, and it's going to be equal to string load from file, settings file. Uh, and then we're going to say if string is not undefined, right? It's undefined if the file doesn't exist, right? Then we're going to say var format string equals empty string, and a var settings string equals empty string because we want to get the format and we want to get the actual like JSON settings. So we're going to iterate through um, our entire string using what's called a for loop. I'm going to say var i equals 1. i is less than or equal to string length of our string and i++. plus plus. So this is kind of like a while loop where it kind of goes multiple times. But it starts as i is equal i is 1. And then it's so long as this is true. Well, so long as i is less than or equal to string length. So if string length is 10, then as long as i is 1, 2, 3, 4, until it gets to 10. And then once it gets to 11, it stops. Then it runs the loop. And then at the end of the loop, it does what's over here, i++, right? So it just kind of increments i every single time and iterates through the string where i is the index of each character, right? Um, and now it's worth noting if you're coming from a different programming language that, this, that Game Maker's a little weird with strings. Um, 1 is actually the first, the first uh, letter in a string. And the, and the length of the string is the last letter in a string. Now, every other programming language that I know of, uh, it's zero indexed. i equals zero, i is less than string length. But unfortunately, in GameMaker, unlike everything else, it is one indexed. Uh, so we have to say i equals one, i is less than or equal to string length, and i plus plus. Uh, if you didn't understand what I just said, don't worry too much about it. Write this, and it works. So we're going to create a var called c, standing for character. It's going to be the string car at our string i, right? Sorry, string i. So c is going to be a single character in a string. So it could be like, oops. So it could be like uh, 0, oops, 0, or it could be h, or whatever, right? Uh, and it's going to be the character at our current index. So c will be every character in the string eventually uh, if we let this continue. So we're going to say, hey, if c is not percent, then our format string uh, can, add, can add c to it. Right? Because we haven't gotten to the percent yet. So let's go. Ahead. Oh, I spelled format wrong up here. You guys are probably yelling at me. Um, if our format string, if, if we haven't gotten to the percent, set, percent yet, sign yet, then our character must be a uh, part of the format. And otherwise, if we have gotten to our, the percent sign, then we can say setting string equals string copy. Oops, string copy, like that. Uh, string i plus 1, string length, string minus i. A little complicated again. I'm going to hit F12 so we can see things better. Uh, a little complicated again, but basically we're just going to take the rest of the string after the percent sign. i plus 1, because i is the percent sign, so we, start, we want to start on the character after i, which means the first i characters we're not touching. So in the length of it's going to be the length of the whole string minus i characters, right? Uh, and that's going to be the setting string. And then at that point we can break, which is the keyword that lets us exit the for loop early, right? So let's get the percent sign. We know what the format string in, we know what the setting string in is. We can go ahead and break out of our for loop. But down here, we can say var format equals real format string. Uh, this just lets us, um, you know, this is like a, a quote zero. And what real does is it changes that to just zero, right? Uh, and if it's not a number, then it's going to crash. But it will be a number since we're manually saving. And I don't really care to, uh, cra to error handle it. Uh, then we're going to say if our format is equal to our settings format, this is the current version of the game settings file, then great. This is exactly what we want. We can delete our settings, and we can uh, go ahead and do JSON, settings equals JSON parse settings string. We're going to parse 
that setting string and we're done it. We've done it. Now, we're going to, now the important thing with this is once we load the settings is we want to actually like apply that to our window size. So we're going to type window set size, uh, game width times game dot settings dot scale and game height times game dot settings dot scale, right? And which is three by default. But if they change the scale, we want it to set the size to the correct uh, size. And then we want to set the window position after we change the size. Because if we change the size, it's just going to stay in the top left corner and it's going to stretch out and it's not going to be very pretty. So we want to basically center the game again. So display get width, which is our entire screen width, minus game width times game dot settings dot scale over two. And then display get height minus game height. I'll go through this again. Times game dot settings dot scale over two. So uh, basically, if the width, so we take the full width and then we subtract the, uh, the width of the window and then we divide that by two. Um, and this is just kind of a way of centering things between things, right? Because, um, here, I'll pull up notepads so this is easier for you, right? Um, what I have written there is display width, basically, minus game width over two, right? Because game width times game settings scale is just like the width of our window. And display get width is just the width of our display. So the reason this works is because if we do display width over two minus game width over two, which is the same thing if you uh, remember anything from algebra class, right? Uh, since this is uh, two fractions with like denominators, we can just subtract the numerators, right? Um, but display width over two is gonna get us to the center of the screen, right? And then we're gonna subtract half of the window width. And now we're at the, at the left side of the window for centering it. And the same thing with the height, right? Display height over two minus game height over two which is we take the height of the display, we divide by two, we get the center of the screen, then we subtract the height of the window over two to get the top of our window. Uh, so that should work well. That's where we got these numbers from. All right, and then lastly here, we want to type, say window uh, set full screen to just be game.settings.full screen. So if we're in full screen mode, just set it to full screen. And then down here, we want to say else if format is less than settings format, then we're going to say show debug message warning uh, old settings file detected attempting to convert. We're going to try to automatically convert a save file. We're going to say var converted string equals, um, I'll just do that for now uh, to do. We'll come back to that. And now, you know, I'll do this now. So. Uh, we actually want to create another script. Uh, we want to right click on scripts, create script, and this is going to be our script that handles conversion. So str underscore save underscore conversion. And we're going to have two functions in here and they're both going to be completely blank right now, or pretty much blank. Function convert old settings, which is going to take in the format and the string. Uh, and basically this is just going to be a switch statement for the format and then just something like that, right? Uh, in GameMaker, I believe you have to put break after return. I don't remember if this is true, but I remember there being an error when I didn't, so I just put break after return. You might not need it though. Um, but you know, right now it's just like, whatever the format is, just return the string. I'm actually gonna change this undefined. If the format's not recognized, we should return undefined, not the string. Um, so if the format's not recognized, return undefined. But basically, as we update the game, we can be like, oh, OK, 0. If the format's 0, then we can uh, var new, uh, converted string equals that. And then we can like make calculations and stuff, you know, and like create that string and return that, uh, like actually can attempt to convert our settings file. But right now, we're on the first version, so we don't need to worry about it. And we're going to take the same thing, and we're just going to add another one, and it's going to be convert old save, and exactly the same thing. We can go back here, and this converted string is going to be equal to convert old settings, and then it's going to be format, and our 
um, setting string, just like that. <clears throat> and then down here, we're gonna say if it's not undefined, if is if not is undefined converted string, then we can say show debug message uh, info conversion successful. And then we can delete settings and settings equals JSON parse converted str. Uh, and then we can just go ahead up here and just copy this window stuff because we also want to do that here. All right. And then otherwise, if it is undefined, then show debug message uh, error conversion failed. Is the file corrupt? And then I want to type show debug message. I'll probably make a better logging system later and then change all this. I'm going to say info and then renaming old settings file. We want to be fair to the player and we don't want them to lose their save data. So what I'm doing here, I'll talk this through in just a moment. So if you're not aware, this backslash is called an escape character. Uh, so if I say backslash quote, then it doesn't end the string, right? It just puts a quote into the string. So we're renaming the file to whatever the name of the file is, um, but with an underscore backup underscore st, which means uh, settings, right? Uh, and then the string format. So whatever format it thinks it is, we're going to rename it to backup and then that format, just so that they have that backup file um, instead of overriding it entirely. Uh, in case, you know, I don't know, they change something and then they didn't want to lose all their data. Uh, it doesn't matter as much for settings, but it will matter a lot more for, for, um, for the actual save file. Um, and then we actually just rename it to exactly what we said we'd rename it to. Just like that. And then we want to say show debug message info done. Just like that. Very easy. Uh, and then down here, we want to have another condition here, else if format is greater than settings format. If we are in a, if we have a newer settings file, uh, then we don't need to bother converting because we can't, right? So we're just going to say show debug message error settings file is from the future. It cannot, oops, it cannot be parsed by this version. Just like that. Then uh, show debug message info. All of this is kind of like just just fluff, you know. It's not wildly important, and you can mess around with this however you want. Um, and this is just the same thing as before. Three dots. Uh, and we can actually just copy uh, this bit right here to the bottom of this. There we go. And there we go. That's that done. So now in save, we're going to do something very similar to, uh, to settings save. Our, our uh, settings save and load are done, by the way. Uh, so in save, we're just going to create our string, but we're going to add a lot more to it. We're going to say save format, and then we're going to add a percent, and we're going to start with our data, JSON stringify our data, and then we're going to add another percent sign, JSON stringify here, just for ease. Oh, I need to add a plus here. Just for ease, I'm going to uh, have these each be on a on, on a a new line for ease of readability. Uh, JSON string of five flag dot flags plus percent plus JSON string of five num dot nums plus percent. Basically, everything we're saving, right? JSON string of five uh, str dot strs. And is that it? I believe that is all the things we're saving. Yep, it is. Um, so we can just uh, semicolon that. And then we can just say string, save to file, our save file, our string, and we do want to encode it by base64, so we can put a tree there. And that's our save function. And this load function is going to be a similar idea to what we did for the load here for, um, for our iterating through here and, and separating the format, but, we get, but it's a little more complicated because we've got a lot more things to parse from it. 
Um, so we're going to start with var string equals string load oops, load from file, save file, and true. We're going to make sure it's not undefined. String, just like that. We have a var format string equals empty string. Var flags string equals empty string. Var nums string equals empty string. Uh, var strs str string string equals empty string and var data string equals empty string. I'm actually going to put the data up top uh, just to match the same order as we have for our, uh, our save. And then we're going to say var str index equals zero. Uh, this is just for us to figure out like, you know, how many percent signs have we come across basically, right? So now we're going to iterate through everything again. And var equals one. Uh, i is less than or equal to string length, string i plus plus, just what we did before, right? Um, and we're going to get our character string car at string i, just like we did before, you know, just whatever string is at each index, uh, sorry, whatever character is at each index, we're going to go through all of the characters. And we're going to say, okay, is, uh, if is it not a percent sign? <laughs> if it's not a percent sign, then we want to add whatever this character is to whatever string we're on. So we're going to switch statement, our string index. By the way, I used the switch statement earlier. I didn't quite explain it. If you're not aware what a switch statement is, it's basically like a, an if statement with a whole bunch of else's, right? We're going to say, OK, well, what is string index? In the case that it's 0, then we want to do something. And I'm going to break. In the case that it's 1, we want to do another thing. And then break. In the case that it's 2, we do thing 3. And we break. In default, we do nothing and then break, right? So basically, it says, oh, is string index 0? Do whatever's in here and then break out of the switch statement. Is it 1? Do whatever's in here, break out. The reason you have to put this break is because if I didn't put this break, then it would do this thing and then it would do whatever's in case 2 as well. And that's useful if you're like, I want case 2 and case 3 to be the same. You can just do case 3, case 2, and then both of them will lead you to this exact same thing. Um, but that's basically what a switch statement is, is it's just an if statement with a whole bunch of different like uh, conditions. So if it's case 0, then we're going to add that character to our format string, because it's we're still in the first section. Um, in other languages, you might see like a string that split at, and then have like a, a regex operator or something, uh, and then it will just split into arrays. Unfortunately, GameMaker doesn't have something like that, which is why we're doing this manually. Uh, if we've come across a percent sign, then add it to, not flags, uh, data string plus equal c. If we've come across 2% signs, add it to flag string. Uh, we don't need default. Case 3, if we come across 3% signs, add it to num string. And if we've come across 4% signs, then add it to uh, data string. Not data, sorry. <laughs> I had data last in my, uh, my little test document here, but I wanted to put it first for this. Uh, string string, just like that, right? Same order, data flags num string uh, as uh, we saved it. Now we can, and the else here, we can say string index plus plus. Uh, this else is for if the character is not percent. So in this case, the character is a percent sign. We want to increase the index. We want to switch over to the next uh, string we want to add so that this can go through. Now, down here, which is outside of uh, this for loop, we can do the same thing as we did before. Because now we've got everything out, but we just have a lot more things. So our format is a, a real of our format string, just like we did with settings. And we're going to do an if statement just like with settings. If it is the same thing as save format, then we can go ahead and load. So delete data, delete flag.flags, delete num.nums, delete string.strings, delete, oh yeah, that's it. Uh, and then. Uh, data equals JSON parse data str. Have to turn yellow. Make sure. Yeah, perfect. Uh, flag dot flags equals JSON parse flags str. Um, num dot nums equals JSON parse nums str. And then string dot strings equals JSON parse. String, string, yep. All right, just bear me with me a little bit longer. But that's all we need for that. Uh, we want to say an else if the format is less than save format. 
uh, we can basically, and I'll say an else if uh, format is greater than save format, we can basically copy the settings one and do some tweaks to it. So let's go ahead and do that um, for this. It's less than settings format. Go ahead and just paste it there. We want to change this to old save file detected, uh, converted string, convert old save, and then it's our, uh, you know what? I need to change this a little bit. Old save should have um, not just one string, but it should have um, data string, flags uh, string, um, nums string, and strings string. It should have all of those. All of those are important. Uh, so this actually needs to be data string, flags string, nums string, and strings string. All of them right there. And then if it's undefined, uh, sorry, if it's not undefined, conversion successful. And then we do this stuff instead of this stuff. Just like that. We delete the data, flags, nums, and strings, and parse them. Uh, and then otherwise, convert failed to file corrupt, remaining old save file. Oh, I see setting was spelled wrong. Let's go ahead and fix that. Uh, renaming old settings file. Uh, old save file to, and then this can be save file, backup SV instead of ST. Uh, and then this is, again, save file, save file, SV. And there we go, right? Perfect. We've added all that. Uh, now we want to copy over what happens if it's greater, right? This little uh, future message. And similar thing, uh, save file is from the future. Uh, rename the old save file to that backup SV. Backup SV, this is a uh, save file, save file, save file. There we go. And that should be everything. That is our save system pretty much done. Poof, that was a lot. So let's go ahead and run the game. And ooh, looks like we got some errors. Let's figure out what's going on. Um, ah, there should be, uh, I, I missed a comma here. Did I miss a comma anywhere else? Doesn't seem like it. Those commas can get you. Yep, there we go. We've run, we've run the game. I can actually uh, just go ahead and close out of this. Um, and if we go to our uh, just go to um, our local app data, which we can do uh, just by uh, take this folder type percent local app data percent. I have plenty of things, including uh, various projects in here. This should be a project pixel um, folder. There it is. And we got a game that save and a settings that that. And if the uh, the settings that that edit, uh, what do we got? We got uh, our format is zero. Our format is zero percent or zero, and then the percent sign. We have our full screen that's false. Our language E and US. Our volume BGM 100. Our volume SFX 100. BGS 100. Scale 3, etc. Right? Perfect. Looks great. Uh, if I try to open the uh, game that save, then oh, that is some characters. But I can copy this and go to a like base 64 decode, paste it in there, decode, and then look at that. We got zero is the format. Nothing in data, game has started is false, random number is 57, and our game title is Project Bissell, right? There's our save. It saved exactly what we wanted to. Let's go ahead and go to settings, and let's change full screen to true. And save it, and see what happens when we open our game. There you have it. We just entered full screen mode. And we don't even have a way to do that in game yet. It just did that automatically. Go ahead and alt that 4 out of that. And because it loaded our, uh, our settings file. Oh, it changed that to 1.0, interesting. Um, yeah, because we loaded our settings file and we saved it again. Change it back to false and we're good. You can also change the scale to whatever you want. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, we will not worry about like uh, changing our settings stuff from in-game until we get to uh, the menu episode. Well, I think that might be pretty much everything. Uh, before I end up this episode though, I'm gonna go ahead and um, add uh, one more thing to the, the save file. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to our macros and we're gonna do something down here. We're gonna have a macro uh, start room and I'm gonna call it room one for now because that's the name of the room that we've been testing. Um, but you know, eventually this is gonna be the name of whatever room uh, the beginning of the game is gonna, is gonna start in, like the, the opening cutscene or whatever, right? We're gonna have a macro start X uh, which for now I'm going to go to room one and I'm going to figure out what our player X is. So our player's vision is 112 and 80. 
So we'll say 112, and then our macro start y to be 80. And then, <laughs> bear with me, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and delete our player from room one. So, how I'm gonna do this, because player is, remember, player is, um, is persistent, is I'm gonna go to our, our game object, which is actually this create event right here, uh, and then in data, uh, the actual uh, reset setting, uh, reset save data there, data. We're gonna add a um, a room colon and then start room. Add an x colon start x and a y colon start y. So this is just the players, uh, like where we're at in the game basically. When um, you know, once we've saved, when I save save the room we're in, the x coordinate and the y coordinate of the player, right? And obviously um, our default settings this is just the first room, the first x, and the first y. But now we no longer have a player, so we want to make sure we create the player when we actually like start the game. So or eventually we're going to do this on the title screen, right? But for now, I'm just going to go into the sequence splash events. Where does the room go to next? And before I do that, I'm going to say instance create uh, depth, and then our player, and just, uh, sorry, our at uh, game.data. X game dot data dot y depth can be zero and it's going to be the player and then we're going to instead of room go to next we're going to say room go to game dot data dot room just like that right and then uh, this will actually change because we want we again we don't want to create the player until we hit like play on the title screen but this is just for our testing purposes let's also go to our rmh splash and step, and instead of just remove to next, we're actually going to call that sequence um, splash end, right? So it'll just call those other things. Now if you run it, then after the splash gun's over, looks like it broke. Uh, we're looking for game.data.x, game.data.y. Okay, the problem was um, we had a save that had an empty data struct. So when we loaded it, it didn't have the things we were looking for. It didn't have X, Y, and room. So we can go ahead and delete our game and settings. This is why settings format and save formats is important once we actually have builds of the game, because it just didn't have the data we were looking for because it wasn't using the default. Um, but we can delete the ones we have saved, and now the default should be used. You can play the game, skip that, and there we are. We're at the position we were before, even though the player wasn't in the room. It was created and put there. So quickly, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go to player, step, and I'm just going to add a little bit of a debug key at the end. I'm going to say if input check pressed, um, we're going to go V just for now. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to say game.data.room uh, equals room, game.data.x equals x, game.data.y equals y. And then we're going to say game.save, all right? So basically, you know, we're setting our room x and y coordinate, and then we're going to save that. And that's just going to give us a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of a debug way of saving our location. So now we're here, right? I'm going to go down here or over to this corner. I'm going to hit V. And then I'm going to close the game. I'm going to open it back up. And I'm going to go ahead. Whoa, look at that. We're right back where we started. The camera did, did a little bit of a bounce. Uh, and I know why that was. That was because we were close to the side of the screen, right? So we were up here in the corner, hit V. Uh, because I forgot to add a clamp, right? Um, but that should be very easy to add. Skip there. Yeah, it moved up to the corner, but our location was saved. And if I go ahead and delete our game.save and settings to save, really just the game.save, and then we run the game again, we are back to our starting coordinate. There we go. Perfect. So obviously, we can combine this to, you know, do this when you uh, hit a save point. Or if you want to do auto saving and have it on a timer or whatever you'd like, right? Um, but there is a save system that just works. And whatever we want to do, we can add as a flag or data or just whatever. Uh, do we want a, an NPC to not be there if a certain, uh, like only be there if a certain flag is set? Cool. Just check, just when the character's there in the create event, check the flag, and if it's false, delete the character. You know, just there's so much you can do with this rudimentary, like, just save uh, system, which is fantastic. I'm quite a big fan of, of the way this works. Uh, I'm going to say, deep, I'm going to actually put this down here. I'm going to say debug stuff. All of this stuff is debug stuff. Uh, in fact, I'll actually say and is death build, even though this is certainly going to be deleted because there's no reason to. Uh, maybe I'll add a keyboard on the a key on the keyboard or something that's not being used uh, if I want to keep this in for 
longer, but for now it's just, it's just you know, before we get um, a menu and stuff in. Let's go ahead and fix that bug with the camera we found real quick. Go to camera. Uh, the problem is, is there an easier way to do this? We want to do this to X and Y. Um, I think we just have to copy this entire if statement, paste it here, and then change this to X, Y, X and Y. I don't like duplicating code. Maybe there'll be a better fix to this later. Oh, and X and Y here as well. Um, but for now, that's what it's going to have to be. And I'll go ahead and test this real quick before we end off the video. Go over to the corner, hit V, uh, close the game, and restart it. Perfect. It works exactly as intended. Let's go ahead and commit our changes today. Git add dash dash all. Git, uh, and we'll go ahead and get status to see what we've changed today. Oh my gosh, a lot of stuff. Crazy. Uh, git uh, commit dash m. We're going to say episode 2 colon. Uh, input, we have splash. We have camera fixes and save system. Bunch of cool stuff. Get to push, and there we go. All our changes are in. All right, with that being said, uh, thank you guys so much for watching. We've made a lot of progress today. We um, kind of revised our input system to work with controllers. Uh, we added a rudimentary save system, which is quite fantastic, if I do say so myself. Um, we have we've added that splash screen as well, uh, and you know we fixed some camera bugs. I think it was a pretty productive day. Next time, we're going to be diving into our audio system that we're going to use. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the way GameMaker handles audio uh, by it, the way it is, the way it does by default. So I have a little bit of an audio system I like to use. I want to show that to you guys, implement into the game, uh, and get that all ready uh, to prepare us for using uh, for implementing the menu system in the, in the episode after that, I think is our plan, right? Uh, we want to do the audio system first just so we have like blips for moving or pressing a button. Uh, and then after the menu system, I'm going to go into a dialogue system. So that's going to be pretty fun. Um, nice few episodes ahead of us. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed, uh, I would love a like, but you know, only if you enjoyed. And subscribe if you don't want to miss when these episodes come out in the future, because uh, I am quite excited for this series. And if you are, let me know. Uh, also, uh, as we continue with this series, if there's anything specific you'd like to see or any requests you'd like for the game, uh, feel free to let me know in the comments, because um, you know if I can get a community built up, which you know who knows if I will be able to, um, I would love to make this game with you guys, you know, take input from you guys and, uh, and develop, put your ideas into it. I would love that. So just let me know in the comments how you feel about that. And I'll see you guys later. Thank you guys so much. Bye.